I'm out of practice. That was bad. There we go. A little bit louder. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Bloomington Noon Rotary. Uh, thank you for being here today. I want to thank Dave Senes, who was our greeter, uh, for welcoming us into our space. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me, there might be one of you. Uh, Jamie Verbrugge, I'm the past president for Bloomington Noon Rotary, filling in for Debbie uh, Belfry, our president who I think is online, yep, she's there, so she's, she's, oh, she's not, okay, all right, well, that's good, so don't tell her how often I screw this up, okay? All right, uh, let's welcome Dave up here, he's going to start us with our invocation. <clears throat> Bow our heads. Our growing season is coming to an end, vacation days, trips, and days at the lake, are also conclu con concluding, excuse me, for another summer. And yet it is a time of the year when we look ahead with excitement and anticipation. The harvest from our farm crops are taken from the ground. Leaves turn color to take on the colors of their glorious fall pageantry. Students, teachers, and staff return to school excited about the hopes and dreams of a new academic year. Stir up within us the excitement that we as Rotarians can catch the excitement and anticipation of looking, looking forward and being forward-looking per persons to the possibilities of a more peaceful and healthy world as we unite under the banner of service above self. In particular, may this club do good things in the lives of our Strive students as we embark on a new year of mentoring. And we also remember the work that we do with the International Village Clinic and the School for Girls Avish, Avishkar. And now we ask for your blessing upon the fellowship of this meeting and the meal that we have eaten. We, we gratefully thank for those who prepared the food and serve it. Amen. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. Uh, and now, Brian Emerson is going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and the four-way test. <clears throat> Will you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And if you will reaffirm our four-way pledge, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Brian. He reminded me that uh, he follows the Boy Scout pledge, always be prepared. So he knew exactly what to do today. All right, let's, um, let's start our meeting today uh, with some announcements. And uh, I'm going to invite Dr. Eric Melby up uh, Dr. Melby is going to talk about the upcoming referendum on the November ballot for the school district. Thank you, Jamie. Good to see you all. Uh, if you don't already understand how these things work in Minnesota, I'll give you a brief, real brief tutorial. But school districts uh, are an entity that has to go to the voters to ask for uh, levy money uh, for certain things and so a lot of districts Bloomington included have something called an operating levy They last for ten years uh, And then after you know eight or nine years uh, you need to continue Collecting that money to do your program and you go back to the voters and, and ask for uh, another approval of it. We're the only uh, governmental uh, Part of Minnesota that that doesn't have the ability that once you get that initial voter approved levy uh, approved that the board can't just uh, renew it when it comes due again. So we have to come back to the voters. And so in Bloomington, we in 2013 passed a safe and innovative schools levy, which uh, was set to raise or fund about $6 million a year for 10 years for the district to uh, work on safety improvements to the district and technology uh, for the district. Uh, thankfully, the voters approved that and we've uh, been using that levy uh, ever since. It's coming due in about a year and a half, and so we're going back to the voters this fall in November asking for renewal of that levy. We're not asking for anything new. We're not asking for anything more. It's the same tax rate, but we are asking for a renewal on that safety and technology levy. 
Uh, you might be wondering, well, what do you do with that money, Eric, at the Bloomington Public Schools? So we've used that over the last number of years to um, have a more robust visitor. Uh, well, actually, we, we did a lot of physical improvements to the buildings, uh, some that, that I talk about in public and, and some that I don't talk about in public to make sure that our students and our staff are safe when they're in our school buildings. But one thing you would definitely notice if you come into our buildings is we have a controlled one entry vestibule where you have to get um, signed in by either a security person or a, or a clerical person in our elementary buildings. Uh, so that we can manage who's in, in and out of our buildings. We've got a robust radio system that goes across the district so we can communicate with built from building to building and within buildings. Uh, and then of course, the pandemic uh, was a, of course a horrible event to happen, but what was interesting for Bloomington Public Schools is we had that voter approved technology levy and had used that uh, a number of years ago to go to one-to-one -one devices for our students. So every student in Bloomington gets a district uh, Chromebook or iPad, kind of depending on your age, mostly Chromebooks. Uh, and we've also worked really hard over time with that levy money to make sure that our families uh, who were struggling with internet access at their house have access, because obviously having a device without internet access doesn't help you much. Um, <clears throat> so what would we do with the renewal of that uh, levy? We would uh, upgrade. Visitor management systems are great, but the technology and the equipment constantly upgrades and changes. So we have some plans to even better improve our, our visitor management system to buildings, security upgrades, uh, a lot of our cameras. We have cameras all over the place that people may or may not recognize when they're in our buildings, but cameras wear out, right? Or you need better technology or better resolution. So upgrading our cameras and communication system. Ongoing trainings, we do trainings uh, on, on uh, threat and risk assessment as well as medical trainings for CPR and the AED machines in our schools, first aid, things like that. Uh, we have license, <coughs> licensing renewal costs and of course the ongoing one-to-one -one effort with our students um, for Chromebooks and for iPads and, and internet ac access. Uh, like I said, the pandemic uh, was interesting for Bloomington Public Schools because we had already embarked on becoming a, a fully certified uh, by the Department of Education online school program where many districts uh, were th thrust into to doing online education for students without much pre-planning other than the two weeks the, the governor gave everybody uh, a couple of years ago in March when schools closed down. So uh, we're thankful for, to the voters uh, for, the, for the levy money that, that had us ready for a pandemic uh, and also now we have one of not one of I think we have the best online uh, school in the state and, and we draw students from Bloomington as well as uh, a number of other districts uh, some near and some as far away as Bemidji and, and Rochester and places like that for our online school so we want to continue that effort with uh, with our technology uh, devices we want to continue it with our digital learning platforms uh, anytime anywhere learning we call it uh, our computer science program is uh, in part funded with that levy, and so we've got computer science immersion programs at a number of our schools. Uh, I'm here today, thank you for the time, and I'll, I know I don't have that much time, um, uh, to provide information for you because I, as a superintendent, can't advocate for, I can't tell you to vote yes for this thing, I, but I can share information with you that you can hopefully share with your friends and neighbors or business associates. Uh, so our schools have an information campaign going on. We've got school teams at each of our sites working with parents and community leaders to ensure folks are aware of what's going on with our with our ask. And then we do have a separate advocacy committee that, that uh, meets outside of school hours, has more community members on it, and they do advocate uh, telling people how they'd like them to vote. I'll, I'll put it that way. How's that? Uh, that committee, uh, if you're interested, there's co-chairs, Curtis Greasel and Paige Roman are the co-chairs, and then our school board reps on it are Tom Bennett and Heather Starks. The team meets at Oak Grove Presbyterian, uh, that group uh, on a weekly basis at 7 a.m. If you're bored at 7 a.m. and want to come and see what goes on with the advocacy committee, you can always show up and probably walk away with the, with the task uh, from that committee. Um, really, our, our effort uh, on probably both ends, but from an informational standpoint, is, is making sure people go to vote. Um, I, we have very strong support of our public schools in Bloomington. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not worried about people liking the work we're doing and supporting the work we're doing. What I'm, if I'm worried about anything, it's folks getting to the polls and, and voting. So early voting has started in Bloomington. Encourage you all as Rotarians to, to go out and vote and certainly encourage your friends and neighbors to vote. What it means for us at the end of the day in terms of money is about $9.8 million a year for security and technology in Bloomington. And if we don't pass the referendum this fall, 
That would be a loss of 9.8 million that we uh, use for technology and security. So it's a big deal for us. Um, but I'll leave you with this, just a few key points. Uh, it's a renewal. It's not asking for anything new or more. Uh, there's no final step to school safety, of course. Uh, you, some of you have talked to me about the incident that happened this weekend at the Richfield football game. I mean, it's an ongoing uh, effort that we have for school security and safety. Uh, we want to reinvest and upgrade those systems and make sure that our kids have the best technology devices and support available to them. So with that, I just wanted to share information with Rotarians about the uh, upcoming referendum in November. And if you have questions, I'm cer certainly happy to answer them after the meeting. Uh, thanks for the time. And you got someone right there. Eric's trying to take my script. He'd leave me completely at sea if you did that. <laughs> That'd be great. That'd be great. Uh, thank you, Eric. And um, as he said, uh, he'll be available after the meeting if you have questions, but you know that you can always reach out to Eric or to Debbie Belfry if you do have questions about this. Uh, one of the things about Rotary is that you know people in the community who you know uh, know that you know things about what's going on. And so the, the, one of the benefits of, of being a member of Rotary is that you can be an ambassador to the community and share information as well. So uh, to the extent that you're willing to share information based on what uh, Dr. Melby has provided, that would be fantastic. Thank you, Eric. All right, let's get to our speaker. Uh, thanks to everybody who contributed to Happy Bucks, and thanks for the rest of you for uh, just being generally supportive, and I presume happy. Right, even if you're not going to pay for it today. Uh, so our speaker today uh, comes to us from the Twin Cities Rotary Eco Club. Uh, Bethany Essie is co-president of that club, and she is a mentor with Climate Reality Leadership Corporation. Um, Climate Reality Leader uh, Corporation is committed to spreading awareness of the climate crisis and to working for solutions to the greatest challenge of our time. Uh, now, Beth was trained with 900 other citizen activists in March of 2017 in Denver and serves as a mentor for the Minneapolis Climate Reality Leadership Core training in August of 2019. Her goal is to tell the story of climate change and its inspiring and, and how it is inspiring communities, the call to action everywhere. She will cover the causes of climate change, the impacts having on our world, and the solutions that are available to halt and reverse global warming, and uh, really appreciate that there is a Rotary Club that is committed to doing this. Beth Essie, welcome to Bloomington Noon Rotary. While we're waiting for the slides to get pulled up, I also got my new COVID booster too, and I got it at CVS. And I noticed one of the new things they have is you can schedule grouping. So I was able to book my husband and myself at the same time. And I thought, okay, they're getting it. They're making this easier. This is great. So I was really excited about that. Um, also, just as we're waiting for the slides too, I want to say thank you so much for inviting me here. Our club, the Twin Cities Rotary Eco Club, is a new club. We chartered about three years ago and we have 30 members. We are small but mighty and excited to um, continue to make an impact as we look for ways that we can educate about the environment as well as do service projects regarding the environment. Uh, we did just complete our first service project last year, which was we took a, a, it's called a freight farm, which is a freight shipping container. And we um, used the University of Minnesota engineering students and paid for them to be able to make it completely off grid and use a rainwater catchment system. So when that was placed in North Minneapolis, it was not a burden on the community to pay for the electricity for that. Um, so that provides uh, new lettuce and other greens to the local grocery store. All right, let's see if we can get started here. All right, this is the one slide that I'm going to actually read to you today. Environmental degradation and global climate change are serious threats to everyone. They are having a disproportionate impact on those who are most vulnerable, those to whom Rotary has the greatest responsibility. Yet environmental issues rarely register on the Rotary agenda. Protecting the environment and curbing climate change are essential to Rotary's goals of sustainable service. The time is long past when environmental sustainability can be dismissed as not Rotary's concern. It is and must be everyone's concern. Uh, 
And this is a quote from one of our um, Rotary International past presidents. And the reason why I like to start the presentation with this is because I think it really does set the stage for what I'm going to talk to you about, which is the reality of global warming and climate change today, what's going on around the world in the US and Minnesota, as well as some of the great things that are being done and why it's important as Rotarians that we are working on this issue to support all of the other things that we do. I will warn you, this is the actual slide deck that former Vice President Al Gore uses when he presents, and I have trimmed it down from over 700 slides uh, to what you will be seeing here today. So we're, we're going to be moving fast and furious, so hopefully um, I only have 20, 25 minutes here. Uh, but first, before we get into any of that, though, I want to just level set and make sure that we are all on the same page about what actually is global warming and what's happening. And so this is a picture of the atmosphere. Now, a lot of times you look up and you think, okay, the sky goes on for forever, this must be really big. But in reality, our atmosphere is very thin. And Carl Sagan once described it as if you think about those old globes, those wooden globes you had in your elementary school room, that layer of vernier on it, that's what we're talking about. The atmosphere is actually very thin. And what it does for us is it kind of provides this, uh, makes us be the Goldilocks of the solar system. We're not too hot for life on Earth. It's not too cold for life on Earth. We are just perfect um, for life on Earth. And that's because as we get radiation from the sun, it passes through our atmosphere. We absorb a certain amount of that. A certain amount gets reflected back. And then of that amount that gets reflected back, some is also then hits the atmosphere and comes back to Earth. So it creates that perfect environment for life on Earth. Well, what we're doing when we put carbon emissions and, and gases into the atmosphere is we're thickening up that atmosphere. Um, so what's happening is as that's getting thicker, more and more of it that is being reflected um, out to space is actually coming back to us and we're heating it up. Now we tried to figure out, well, how can we actually help people understand how much energy we are trapping? additional energy when we thicken that atmosphere. And what you're seeing here is courtesy of NASA, because they tried to help us figure out, it's such a big number, how can human brains understand this? So the unit of measurement that they chose is atomic bombs. So if you think about an atomic bomb and the amount of energy and heat that's being released when an atomic bomb goes off, what they were able to calculate is that the equivalent energy that we are trapping um, per year, or excuse me, per day, 365 days a year is the equivalent to exploding 600,000 atomic bombs. That's how much we are trapping. That's how much energy is being captured by us. Now, you know a lot of the sources of where this is coming from. This is just a refresher. There may be a few on here that maybe you haven't thought about recently. Animal agriculture, um, crop burning. You know, Most people think of industrial processes and transportation, but these are some of the other areas that can contribute to the greenhouse gases. And we know that this is making our Earth warmer because when we've looked at this and we've said, okay, well, what are some of the, the hottest years that we've experienced? They've all been in the most recent years since uh, 19 of the past 20 have been there since 2002. And of that, you've seen that some of these hottest years have been in the past seven. So what does that mean for Minnesota? Now, I'm a lifelong Minnesotan. You can probably tell when I say Minnesota. Uh, I was born and went to, raised in Minnetonka, and so I went to Minnetonka High School. And I've lived here all of my life except for four years when I lived in South Florida. Um, and so we know if you've lived here and you've been born and raised in Minnesota, you know that these things are happening, but, but let me put it into perspective for you. In Hennepin County here, you can see that our average temperature, annual temperature change since 1895, this is through 2018, has gone up about 1.6 degrees Celsius. And Minnesota, as a state, our temperatures increase about three degrees Fahrenheit. And we're considered one of the fastest warming states in the, U in the US. There we go, okay. This slide, when we think about this, again, if you've been born in Minnesota, this isn't news to you. Um, one of the things that I always tell people, if they know where Minnesota is on a map, what's the first thing they tell you they know about Minnesota? It's cold. But we know it also gets really hot here. And when you think about how hot it gets, now this is for days where the heat index is over 105. So we're talking our hottest days in summer here. In 2003 days, that's about right. You know, it doesn't get hot that hot that often, but we do get a couple, a few days. 
Well, if we continue on this trajectory, what they're projecting is by 2030, 12 days, and then by 2050, 23 days in Minnesota where the heat index is above 105. That's over three weeks. That's not Minnesota, that's like Florida or Louisiana. I mean, that's not the Minnesota that I know and that I grew up in. But that's what's coming if we stay on this trajectory. And we're, when we talk about not just heat index, when we're looking at temperatures, just the actual temperature being above 90 degrees, where we're headed is where we're projected to experience 30 more days with temperature above 90 degrees. And even as important is 30 fewer days with temperatures below freezing. Now, in a couple months, we're all gonna be like, that actually sounds pretty good right about now, a fewer temperatures, but we know that we need that. We need that not only for our identity as Minnesotans, but we need that for our economy in the state as well, for all of the things that rely on frozen lakes and snow that we do here in this state. Imagine 30 days fewer, an entire month removed of temperatures below 32 degrees. And of course, ticks. I can't skip this part of the presentation. Um, this is actually really near and dear to my heart because my grandpa just passed last year and he had suffered from Lyme's disease for the past 20 years. Um, and so if you know anybody who's been affected by any tick-borne disease, unfortunately, as we get warmer and as we get wetter, this is only going to become more and more prevalent in our state. And the mosquitoes. I mean, I was like, do I even put this slide in? I don't even need to tell you this because you know this. If you've lived in Minnesota your whole life, you know that we have more and more mosquitoes and more and more mosquito days and our season is getting longer. But of course, this isn't just happening to us in Minnesota. It's happening around the US and around the world as well. These are some information from last year when the Pacific Northwest had a huge heat wave. Look at these numbers, almost 116 degrees in British Columbia, Canada. And as we're going around and we look at the rest of the world, this is from last year, from June of 2021, we had four countries in the, in the world where it exceeded 122 degrees. So things are getting hotter. And at least here in Minnesota, for most of us, or many of us, when it gets to be super hot, what do you do? You go in your air conditioning. That's something that we have here. Not everybody around the world has access to air conditioning. So what are you gonna do when it's 122 degrees out and you don't have anywhere to go? Well, we know that this is affecting around the world. I'm gonna show you just a couple pictures now from things just strictly related to heat. Um, so this was in Sicily where the escargot were actually dying in their shells because it was getting so hot. Uh, Tunisia, they reached 122.5 degrees last year. This is in India from a few years ago where they had 36 people who died because it got to be 123 degrees and they didn't have anywhere else to go. And in Pakistan, now Pakistan, I learned about this at the training, it's really interesting because they don't have access widespread to air conditioning, they actually have a new springtime ritual that they do because they know it's gonna get so hot that they're going to experience people who are not gonna be able to make it through the summer. So this is what they do. They, every single year, go out there and they just proactively start digging graves because they know that they're gonna have people that are not gonna make it through the heat this year. So this is already happening around the world. This isn't what climate change is going to bring to us and the heating of the atmosphere. This is already going on. And we know, and this is gonna be a theme throughout the presentation, that this doesn't affect everybody the same way. That there are certain populations, specifically the populations that we care about as Rotarians, that are more susceptible to heat the elderly, the poor, and the homeless, infants, and children. And it's not just where people live either. We need to care about it getting hotter in places where there are not people. This was from uh, 2020 in Siberia. It reached 104 degrees Fahrenheit. It's the highest temperature ever on, uh, recorded to that point in the Arctic. And why does that matter? It matters because what happens when the North Pole gets hot like that is instead of keeping the cold air up there, it pushes it down. You may remember a term, polar vortex. Ring a bell with anybody? That's what causes it because the cold air that's supposed to be up there, it's heating up and it's pushing it down. And we know this was from last year um, where we were able to see this wasn't as bad as it got a few years ago, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, but we've seen that continue to go down throughout the US. 
Uh, this is just a picture from a couple of years ago. We all remember this, the polar vortex. I think this is really interesting that they include this in the global training because they always point out how cold it got in Minnesota and we're like, yeah, it got cold. Um, but again, we had access to heat, right? Nobody was outside when it was negative 53 wind chill. Um, we had access to protect ourselves. Now, one of the other things that happens, so we're, we're not just talking about it's getting hotter, is when it gets hotter, there's actually more moisture that gets pulled up from the ocean into the atmosphere. And that means that the downpours are getting bigger. The storms are getting stronger and they're getting more frequent. If you remember from a few years ago in Minnesota here, we actually had 60.21 inches of rain in Harmony. So they set a new record. And we had some flooding around the Twin Cities area. This is just a picture from that time in St. Paul. But again, it's not limited to us. This was from last year in Tennessee, where 22 people died after they had flooding in the parts of um, Tennessee when they got 17 inches of rain in 24 hours. And then I keep this information in here talking about Hurricane Harvey because we don't experience hurricanes here in Minnesota, but the, as someone who lived in West Palm Beach, Florida for four years and experienced my first hurricane, <laughs> I keep this in here because it, the hurricanes are getting stronger. And the thing about the hurricanes and why I wanted to point this out is because I think this Hurricane Harvey story does a good job of explaining how there's inequities around climate change. Because if you notice here, this was some flooding that happened in this Houston area, which resulted in these toxic chemical releases. Well, who lives here? Whose neighborhood is this? It's not the affluent people's neighborhood. They're not the ones who are being affected by this. And in fact, it was so bad that the poor people's campaign has now added ecological devastation as one of their lists of primary evils because of how disproportionately it affects people. And then, of course, Siberia, Russia, you're probably not, if somebody said, name me a place on Earth that floods, Siberia is probably not the first one that comes to your mind. Um, but here we had people who died because of flooding a few years ago. In China, this was from 2019. Germany from last year, if you remember hearing about that in Germany, it doesn't know any climate change and floods, for example. They know no boundaries. They know, okay, who you are, where you live, how much money you have. It's happening all around the world. And then this is a picture from last year from Australia as well. But the thing about this is it, it's really a double-edged sword. So we're getting hotter and the atmosphere is pulling more water into the air. But at the same time, it's pulling more moisture out of the ground, which means that we're having worse droughts. And so if we look here, we know that droughts are going to be increasing. And I didn't know this until I read this report um, as part of the training, but that by 2050, Minnesota is actually projected to be one of the top five worst drought affected states. And you think, well, how? How does that affect us? Well, if we don't have water, we can't farm. And we got a lot of Minnesota that's made up of farms, right? And also, this affects our lakes, our rivers, all of the things, again, that we're known for here in Minnesota. So it does affect us. And this is from last year. You can see, I mean, I don't necessarily need a slide if you've been paying attention to the news at all. You know how bad the droughts are out in the western states and how much increasing that this is causing for the wildfires as well. So it's all contributing to the same thing. This is actually a picture from Lake Mead, Nevada. So you can see here on the line when the reservoir was last full was in 2000 and where it's at now. So it's been at the lowest level since we filled it before the Great Depression. And again, just a couple more examples from around the world. This is from a reservoir in India, 2018, the same one a year later in 2019. And with this particular reservoir in India, you know, it's not the rich people who are necessarily being affected by that. They can afford to go get water, to buy water, to have clean water. It's the people who don't have access to that, who are struggling, the poor people, to not only find water, but also to pay for it and to carry it back to their homes. And I found this particularly interesting. I kept this slide in because even though it's a few years old, in the same area they had uh, uh, so, such few water, access to water, that the doctors had to go and buy it. And about, let's see, that was July. A few months after this, it was actually the day before Thanksgiving in 2019, <laughs> I had to go to Methodist Hospital and have an emergency appendectomy, <laughs> uh, which I didn't know, but I guess it runs in my family. And I think about this all the time when I do this presentation. 
I cannot even imagine if I would have got to Methodist Hospital for, to get my appendix out and they wouldn't have had water to do my surgery. But that's the reality for people around the world and that's the reality for them already today. And this is just a picture from uh, Madagascar from last year as well, where they've got a number of people over 1 million facing famine and food insecurity. And Mexico. And this is from April of last year, where more than half of their reservoirs are already at 50% or less of their capacity. And I want you to think about this as we talk about sort of Mexico and let's talk about Central America. This is the dry corridor, a number of countries where they've been experiencing year after year after year drought. I'll show you one from uh, El Salvador. This is June and August. So what's happening here is that if you don't have water to drink, you don't have water to grow crops, you don't have a way to feed your family, you don't have a job, what are you gonna do? You're gonna fight to survive and you're gonna leave and you're gonna go to try to find somewhere where you can make a life. And we know, if you remember hearing about the caravan that came up from Central America through Mexico, we know that this is a big reason for why people were on the move is because they had been sustaining these year over year droughts. And we 10.3 million people already just from last year, 2020 to 2021, have been displaced by these extreme events. So think about that. As these start to get worse, as the storms start to get worse, as it starts to get hotter and we're seeing more droughts and more floods, where are all these people gonna go? Who's gonna take care of them? If they can't live in their homeland where they've been for generations, where are they gonna go? And how, how can we help them? Um, at this point, these, this projection is actually a little bit old from 2018, but they were projecting that we could see up to a billion climate migrants moving around the world. So when we add all this together, we only talked about a few of these, how it's getting hotter, how the downpours are getting stronger, how the droughts are getting more frequent. If we look at this through 2020, you can see the data here, the extreme weather catastrophes are increasing and increasing. And what that also means is that it's costing us more. $2.5 trillion in the last decade. So if we, this also affects our economy and our ability to provide jobs and security. So as you can see here, we've got, go back to this guy, the cost of carbon is high. So we, we're not gonna go through every single one of these, but it's affecting us and it's happening now. But the good news is, sort of the end of the doom and gloom portion of the presentation. The good news is that we have solutions at hand. In particular, as Rotarians, what have we done recently? We've added a seventh area of focus, helping the environment, making it much, much easier for us to give our time, our energy, our talents, and our money to things that can go and help the environment. And I know if you look at this based on just the brief discussion we've had so far, you can see that supporting the environment ties into each and every other one of these areas of focus. So as you're thinking through your grants and as you're thinking through your service projects, think about how does this impact the environment? How can the environment, is, is there something going on in the environment that's making what we're working on more challenging or more instrumental or more impactful within the community? And is there a way to tie that in? Let's talk about some good news now. Why it's really, really actually exciting to see the global community pulling together to address this problem. We talk about wind energy. You can see here globally, the wind energy capacity has been increasing as it's been getting cheaper and cheaper to build the wind turbines. And in Minnesota as well, we're following the same suit. We're actually one of the best states when it comes to utilizing our wind. You can see across here, this is a, a couple of years old now, but you can see all the different wind farms as well as the different manufacturers. And what I also hope you see here when you look at this map of Minnesota is jobs, because this is what it's creating the, the green energy economy for our state. And even though this is four years old, I still keep it in here to show the progress that we've made as a state. We are in one of the top 10 in terms of percentage of electricity, as well as by megawatts installed. So we are doing a phenomenal job and you should be proud to be from the state of Minnesota as we're helping to harness the power of the wind. And the reason why we want to care about the wind is because we could just use wind. We, we have enough wind. <laughs> wind. Wind alone would be enough to give us all of our energy and electricity needs. And yes, that's accounting for everybody having an Apple Watch and an iPhone and an iPad and a laptop and all of the things, right? Uh, we've, got, we've got plenty of energy from wind if we can harness it all. 
But we know it's not windy every day and it's not windy in the same place all the time. So we can't just rely on wind. We need to look at other areas of clean energy. So if we take a minute to look at solar, it's the same story, which is really, really exciting. Around the world, you can see the solar insta installations going up and the same thing from Minnesota. Um, and we're gonna see more and more of this as the technology for solar gets cheaper and cheaper. If you've ever been to Rockford, Minnesota, you might have seen this or something like this in some parts of the state. These are community solar gardens and solar projects. So if you don't have the funds to put solar panels on your house yourself, you can actually get your energy from a solar garden and just pay to get that. So it makes it more accessible for everybody. And we have more solar projects than any other state, which is really exciting. Around the world, this is a picture from Australia where you're seeing more and more homes getting solar. The Vatican has solar, and my personal favorite, the Kentucky Coal Mining Museum, which in 2017 added solar to their museum. Um, now, yeah, that's a little bit ironic, but the reason why I keep this in here is because it, it makes an important point, and that is I wish all of this was happening because everybody cared about the environment. That would be amazing. Um, but I'm also a realist, and I know that that's not actually what's happening. Uh, yes, altruism is there, but also from a business perspective, this is what's happening. The Kentucky Coal Mining Museum crunched the numbers and realized that if they installed solar, they could save themselves eight to $10,000 per year in energy costs. Now, I have no idea what those energy costs of that museum are, but I'm gonna guess that eight to $10,000 per year is kind of a big deal for the Kentucky Coal Mining Museum. And we're seeing that happen more and more as renewable energies become more and more inexpensive, the tides are tipping. And at a certain point, businesses aren't gonna say, you know what, I'd like to you know, increase my expenses. Businesses don't do that. They wanna decrease their expenses. So if there's a cheaper way to get electricity to run their business, they're gonna take it. And that's what we're seeing happening. Um, we're also seeing something that's called leapfrogging, which we've seen an example of in some of the developing countries where instead of going to install phone landlines, because cell phone technology got so cheap so quickly, they leapfrogged it and went right to cell phones. The same thing is happening with solar. Because the technology is getting so inexpensive so quickly, instead of building all of the, the electricity lines, they're just leapfrogging and going right to solar. So a lot of this increase in solar that we're seeing is actually being led by developing nations, which is fantastic. So this is an example of pay as you go solar. And again, solar is enough. We have plenty of solar. We get enough electricity. We talked about the bombs, how much energy comes from the sun. We could just use the sun. And between the sun and wind, we have enough to cover everything that we need. Um, a couple more things related to Minnesota here before I wrap up is as of 2021, we now have 29% of our electricity generation is coming from renewables in the state of Minnesota, which is fantastic. And in the US, this was from 2020, we're getting 81% of our new capacity from electricity is coming from solar and wind. So a lot of good things are, are happening in the US that sometimes maybe is getting lost in some of the other news want to make sure to point that out. And, and that's being driven by this reduced cost. So I talked about this before, but you can see here how um, the cost for the solar and the wind has been going down. And that's what's really driving this adoption. And the project projections are that in a couple of years here, they will actually be the cheapest source of new electricity for the entire world, which would be fantastic. A few other things we know that this can happen all on our own, that we do need some policy <laughs> behind what we're doing. And so there's a Powering Pass Coal Alliance and 166 countries have joined this so far. Minnesota has actually joined at the um, subnational level. So we're involved in this as well. And we are a part of the uh, Climate Alliance, where we've got 24 different states representing over half of the population in the United States that have come together and said, okay, we're gonna work together on this. Um, now, one thing I wanna point out here is, do you notice something about this list of states? Do you notice how it's a nice mix? right? We've got states on there like California, New York, Washington, but we also have states like Louisiana, North Carolina, Virginia. So it's 
dare I say, a bipartisan effort to come together and work together uh, to try to um, see what we can do from a legislative perspective. And then, of course, we know we passed legislation in 2007 in this state where we have set our own targets to compare to 2005 to get those reduced by 80% by 2050. I think we're actually a little bit behind on this, the last thing that I heard, but uh, we actually passed that legislation in 2007. And then, of course, we can be very proud in Minnesota that we have three cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and St. Louis Park, that have committed to going to 100% renewable electricity. You can see the other cities in the U.S. that have done that, and we have a handful that are already there and already getting there. A few more things. It's not just the cities, the people, the municipalities. Global corporations are coming together as well. Again, I would love to say that this is because they've all decided that they care about the planet. It's not. <laughs> it's because especially things like insurers, if you're paying attention on that other slide, all of those floods, all of the things that the insurance companies are insuring, it's getting more and more expensive. So they're thinking about their long-term viability as a company and going, hmm, it might be in our best interest if we can start to help to curb this. Uh, so here are just some examples of the companies. And in Minnesota already, we have a number of major companies that are already procure procuring their energy from renewable sources. So I just want to close with this, which is, I've shared a lot of information with you, but what can you actually do about this? Uh, so there's a couple of things. I already noticed here that there were no uh, plastic water bottles. Yes. Um, and that you were using reusable plates and napkins and everything, so that's a big win. So I would just ask as you go through your rotary activities, can you think about ways that you can reduce your use? Can you carpool? Are there small things that you can do in the rotary community? And also, if you have people in your life that you've been wanting to get involved in Rotary, but maybe haven't been a fit for a traditional club, if they care at all about the environment, you can send them our way to the Twin Cities Rotary Eco Club. We do most of our meetings online, um, and we're really trying to do a new club design where we're <laughs> a little bit uh, more uh, friendly to people throughout the entire Twin Cities, so we're not geography-based. Uh, we have people from all over the state, actually, and somebody from Iowa who just joined. So every one of our uh, presentations has to do with the environment. We meet twice per week online at 6.30 p.m., and our dues are $240 per year. Uh, we also do gift memberships for six months or a year. So with the holidays coming up, if you're looking for something special for someone in your life and you want to get them into the Rotary community, you know, give the gift of Eco Club membership. That would be amazing. And then you can also host a presentation. But I'll just close by saying that the absolute number one biggest thing that you can do is just to simply believe that you can make a difference. And I call to you as Rotarians and to think about when polio came along and we observed and we saw children who were being crippled and the suffering and we said no we're not going to allow this to happen anymore and what did people say they said it's too big you're never going to be able to make an impact it's not your job to cure polio that's somebody else's job and we as Rotarians came together and we said no we're going to put an end to this and we can do this same thing when it comes to climate change so thank you very much for having me I really appreciate your time Two minutes for questions. If anybody has any questions for Beth, I imagine that you're happy to take a couple. Sure. Hi. Um, uh, yesterday on 60 Minutes, they had three correspondence simulta or not sequentially on, but all on the split screen. One at the um, Colorado River, which we hear about a lot. One at the Yangtze River, and in between at the Rhine River, showing all three of those river bases, which are essential to commerce and recreation in the countries are Greg, how are we doing with the Minnesota River, the Mississippi River, the Crow River, the Red River? Yeah, I don't know. The question is, how are we doing in terms of our rivers in Minnesota? The one that I know we've had speakers on in the Eco Club specifically has been the um, Mississippi River and the efforts to re-meander the river. Um, so that we can and take out the dams so that we can not only improve the ecology there, but also get back to some of the natural 
um, benefits that we were like we're missing out on some of the fish population um, I know that that's run into a few challenges in particular we had a speaker who was discussing the Coon Rapids Dam and one of the issues in that part of the state is not so much that the dam doesn't necessarily produce the hydropower anymore but if we were to remove the dam one of the implications of that is that the, the river would then flow instead of backing up which means there's a number of people whose waterfront properties would no longer be waterfront properties. Uh, they would be marshfront properties for, for quite a ways uh, if we let the river go back to its natural state. Uh, so I know that there are things that we're looking to do that have real life implications that we can't, but know that there are a lot of people working on trying to get the Mississippi River back to what it is in the Boundary Waters and, and yeah. Um, so that's, I don't want to speak anymore because I don't know too much more about that, but that's a great question. One more question, anywhere? Dave? I'd just like to toss out a couple of <clears throat> me, perspectives. One is we're in a situation where we have to start quoting, Lord help us, the former governor of Alaska, mine, baby, mine, because we have offshore all our mining. And right now, the source of the rare earth metals that we're going to use is largely China and the Congo. The other one is that although the sun is always shining somewhere, the wind is always blowing somewhere, some of the studies a few years ago showed that the amount of interconnection that would be needed would require an enormous amount of copper and I'd like you and other people to consider the impact of next generation nuclear power. Yeah, we, we've actually had so kind of the comments were around the infrastructure needed to build because the wind's blowing everywhere and the, the sun is not always shining the right places um, and then some of the, the cost to the environment to build the infrastructure to get that energy transferred around and also next gen nuclear uh, we did have a speaker that came to the eco club specifically talking about nuclear and i know that's sort of a hot topic when you talk to environmentalists in terms of is nuclear considered renewable and clean energy or not um, but at this point at least the rhetoric that i've heard is we need every single thing that we can get <laughs> and so if the worst thing we have to do is consider nuclear because we, you know, as an alternative, let's do it to get us to where we need to go. And then there's so much technology, it's moving so quickly, there could be things available in three years from now that we didn't even know were possible to exist. Um, so yeah, I do, I agree with you. I do think that nuclear needs to be considered. That's a personal opinion. <laughs> Yes, so um, I, I actually will be around a little bit later. I know you want to wrap up for any additional comments or questions, but thank you again so much for allowing me to come and speak. I appreciate it.